The American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and the American Academy of Pediatrics both recognize the female cycle as the fifth vital sign of health that women should learn to monitor beginning in adolescence. And so our society would do well to recognize all women are smart and capable of learning to observe the signs of their cycle and using that information to interpret whether or not they may be fertile or may not be. Hello and welcome. My name is Grace Emily Stark. I'm the editor of Natural Womanhood. Today I'm here with Dr. Marguerite Dewayne of an organization called FACTS. Now FACTS stands for the Fertility Appreciation Collaborative to Teach the Science. The science of what, you might be wondering? Well, that's the science of fertility awareness-based methods, often called fertility awareness methods or methods of natural family planning. Now, what are fertility awareness-based methods might be your next question. Well, that's what we're here today to talk with Dr. Duane about. Um, so without further ado, Dr. Duane, let's start by tackling these terms. What is a fertility awareness method? Great question, Grace, and thanks so much for inviting me here to share with your audience. Um, natural or fertility awareness-based methods are ways in which a woman can learn to observe visible signs or biomarkers that reflect internal hormonal changes that she may experience throughout her cycle. By learning to observe these external signs, women can identify their are days when they are not able to get pregnant, pregnant and their days of potential fertility when they could possibly conceive a child. By learning to observe these signs, and there are three signs which we can talk about in more depth, cervical fluid secretions, basal body temperature, and urinary hormones. By learning to observe these three signs and identify her potential window of fertility, a woman can work with her partner to identify their potential fertility and modify their behavior depending on their family planning goals. So for example, if a couple is trying to conceive, they would use those days of potential fertility to engage in sexual relations in hopes of achieving a pregnancy. But if a couple is using these methods to prevent or postpone or space a pregnancy, then they would avoid having sexual relations during that potential fertile window to hopefully prevent pregnancy if that's their goal. So with natural or fertility awareness-based methods, couples I observe external signs or biomarkers that reflect internal hormonal changes to identify their potential window of fertility and use that information to achieve their family planning goals. Great. Thank you. So let's talk a little bit about the history of these methods. What's the science behind them? Where did they get started? What's the connection to, you know, the quote unquote rhythm method? Yeah. Great question. Believe it or not, the science underlying natural um, or fertility awareness-based methods actually goes well back into the 1800s when a female physician first discovered that the basal body temperature rises about a half a degree in women at the second half of their cycle. At this point, researchers and scientists still didn't even fully understand ovulation or what, when that occurred and what triggered that, but they started to observe these signs. Other physicians started to notice the relationship between cervical mucus and fertility. But the biggest scientific advance really occurred in the 1920s when two scientists, Dr. Herman Naus and Dr. Uh, Ogino from Japan, independently discovered that ovulation occurs approximately 12 to 16 days before the next period occurs. Again, prior to that, physicians and scientists did not know whether women ovulated reflexively in response to sexual intercourse if they ovulated during their period. What they discovered was ovulation occurs on average about two weeks prior to the onset of their next period. Um, just a side note here, the term period we use uh, frequently colloquially, you know, this refers to the menstruation or the menstrual bleed, but the reason we call the menses the period is it actually marks the end of the ovulatory cycle, that ovulation having occurred two weeks prior. Now, based on this um, latest science from the 1920s, Dr. Leo Latz, an obstetrician gynecologist at Loyola University in Chicago, developed a method called the rhythm of fertility and sterility, which is more affectionately referred to as the rhythm method. 
Using that information that ovulation occurs about 14 days prior, Dr. Latz developed a specific formula that women could use to identify that potential window of fertility. So effectively, women would look at the length of their six previous cycles and take the length of their longest cycle and their shortest cycle, and using a formula subtracting a certain number of days, she would identify that potential window of fertility moving forward. Now, the rhythm method at the time in the 1930s, nearly a century ago, was an effective method. It was based on the best research at the time, but science has evolved. I tell my students we didn't have antibiotics. We didn't develop the first antibiotics until the late 1940s, and antibiotics weren't even widely prevalent until the 1950s. So we don't treat infection today like we did in the pre-antibiotic era. Just like options for fertility awareness-based methods have evolved since the 1930s. Um, Starting in the 1960s, the Billings Method, which is known as the first modern evidence-based fertility awareness method, was developed by Dr. John and Evelyn Billings, who observed cervical fluid secretions, and specifically the sensation that women experience with cervical fluid, used that information, again, to help women identify that potential window of fertility. Further research led to the development of the basal body temperature and symptothermal methods, which uses basal body temperature plus mucus to identify the fertile window, um, continued to evolve in the 1970s. We saw the development of the Creighton model, the 1990s, the development of the Marquette model, which uses cervical fluid secretions plus urinary hormones. And then in the 2000s at the Georgetown Institute of Reproductive Health, they developed the standard days, the two-day and the lactational amenorrhea method. So the research continues to evolve. These methods have continued to evolve and be refined. But the key difference between modern natural methods and the rhythm method is that with the rhythm method, women would use retrospective data, the length of her six previous cycles to try to predict her fertile window in the current cycle. With modern methods, cervical mucus methods, symptom thermal methods, urinary hormone methods, women use data in real time. That is looking at the cervical mucus observations today to identify whether or not she may be fertile today or not. So those differences in combination with the extensive research that have been done with modern methods have led us to having a whole suite of options that we can offer women who would like to manage their fertility and plan their families naturally without the use of synthetic hormones or devices. Great. That's such a great explainer for us, Dr. Duane. Thank you. Now, so somebody sitting here listening to that might <clears throat> kind of feel overwhelmed by all of the different options, right? Because you just hear fertility awareness method and you think, oh, it's just one method. But no, you just named, you know, five or six, seven, eight different mm -hmm. methods for us. So when a woman is thinking about do, using a fertility awareness method, what questions should she ask herself when she's trying to figure out which one is right for her? Sure. Great question. The first thing I always encourage women to do is just to learn the basics about her cycle and understand the different signs. And at FACTS, we offer a webinar called The Facts About Fertility, where we go through and explain the three key signs of fertility, cervical fluid secretions, basal body temperature, and urinary hormones, okay? And we explain how these reflect the different hormonal changes. With that knowledge, women can then consider what matters most to them when it comes to charting their cycle. Again, there are cervical mucus-only methods, like the Billings ovulation method and the Creighton model. Some women like the simplicity of having one sign which to observe. For some women, that may, may not be enough because observing cervical fluid sensation or observations for some may seem to be more subjective and they may like a more objective measure. In that case, adding in the basal body temperature in conjunction with cervical fluid secretions may make more sense. For some women that like to cross their T's and dot their I's, they often will like a cross-check method. So the symptothermal method is a perfect example. The symptohormonal method, which was developed by the Marquette uh, team, is also a cross-check method in that women can learn to, again, observe cervical fluid secretions plus urinary hormones. The nice thing about the urinary hormone monitor, unlike basal body temperature, which you have to take at the same time every single morning, with the urinary hormone monitor, you do need to check your urine in the morning, but you have about a six-hour window. So you've got a little more flexibility about when you would need to check. Um, some women may actually not want to observe any signs. They may be like, oh, I don't know that I want to think about cervical mucus. That just seems, you know, I, that just seems weird to me. There are actually modern calendar-based methods such as the standard days method, 
which um, has now, there are now apps as well, like the Dot app, which is part of Clue, that use a standard calendar calculation to identify that window of fertility. The standard days method, um, although it is a calendar method like the rhythm method, has been studied extensively and is considered by the World Health Organization to be a modern method. Now, my personal favorite method of all the methods um, that are available, I've not really mentioned, is the lactational amenorrhea method. And with that method, women who have given birth within the last six months, who have not had a return of their menses, and who are breastfeeding exclusively or nearly exclusively, can use this method to effectively prevent pregnancy, at least for the first six months. Reason it's my personal favorite is there's nothing you need to do except nurse your baby. So it promotes good mother-baby bonding, good health for mom and baby, lots of advantages to it. But when it comes to choosing a method, we encourage women to you know, assess how many signs they want to observe and which signs. Do they want to use technology? Like, do they like the idea of using a thermometer um, or uh, a urinary hormone monitor? What is their availability to teachers? Now, since the pandemic, almost we have teachers in almost every method that teach online. So these methods can be made widely available to a broader audience. Um, what, uh, what is the, your reason for using a method? Are you using the method because you're trying to plan your family and achieve a pregnancy? Are you a teenager just really wanting to track your cycle and getting a better understanding of like, when's my next period going to come? Or why do I have this like emotional kind of roller coaster for a few days? So for depending on the, the woman, her age, her reasons for using a method, there is a method that is right for her. And at facts, we always tell people the best method is the one that works best for that woman or couple. And that's going to vary from woman to woman and couple to couple. And it will even vary for a given woman, depending on where she is in her reproductive life. Again, from a personal perspective, I've pretty much used every single one of these methods at various points in my reproductive life, because at different points in my life, various methods made more sense and were easier to use. So we tell women, you know, be open, find a method that works best for you. If you experience a change or a struggle, then look to see what other method might work well. Final note, I just want to say, regardless of which method you choose, almost every single method, modern method, which has been studied for effectiveness from family planning, is taught via trained instructors. And I cannot emphasize this enough. If you want to use a method effectively, it is critical to learn from a trained instructor. They like to think, oh, it's natural and it's easy. Well, breastfeeding is natural. And for some women, it's easy. But for a lot of women, it's not. You know, riding a, mic, a bike might seem natural and easy. And in the beginning, you know, you're like, how can I balance? But once you've been riding a bike for a while, you can't even remember what it was like to not be able to have that skill set. But it's always best to learn with somebody by your side, guiding you, explaining, showing you how to use it so that you can develop that confidence to use it effectively long term. Yeah, that's very critical advice, <clears throat> definitely. And I will second that, too. Um, and not just because I'm an instructor myself. Um, but because I know that it makes a difference with the effectiveness. So let's segue mm -hmm. into effectiveness now. Um, obviously, a woman wants to know that she's going to be able to use a method effectively and what the stats are to back that up, right? So mm -hmm. every method publishes different data, though, around effectiveness. And there's, you know, different ways that the effectiveness of fertility awareness is compared to the effectiveness of contraceptives. Um, there's some nuances there that sometimes get lost in the translation, right? Um, so let's talk a little bit more about that, the effectiveness of the sure. different methods, especially in comparison to contraception. Yeah, and that's a really important conversation to have. And, you know, at FACTS, our focus is actually on educating the medical professional community about fertility awareness-based methods, um, in particular the effectiveness rates, because it's something that is not accurately communicated in medical schools or nursing schools. Um, and again, I think it's because of those nuances that you uh, refer to. First and foremost, um, and I know we've partnered with Natural Womanhood to highlight, you know, for decades, the effectiveness rate quoted by the CDC was a very misleading statistic because it was one statistic that kind of lumped all the methods together um, right. and does not accurately reflect. When you're looking at the effectiveness, you do need to look at the effectiveness of the individual methods. And there are two types of effectiveness. There's correct or perfect use, and there's typical use. 
The reality is, is nobody is perfect and nobody is going to use a method 100% correctly, whether it's a natural uh, method of family planning, a condom, a birth control pill, a depo shot, nobody uses any method perfectly. And so it's really important to look at the typical use effectiveness rate. Again, the studies on typical use and correct use of these methods um, primarily were done in patients that learn these methods from trained instructors. So again, learning from a trained instructor is critical. Um, but what's important to note is I encourage people not to compare effectiveness rates like apples to apples. So for example, in our facts presentation, um, fertility awareness-based methods for family planning, we highlight that the Billings ovulation method was the highest quality study. It was done in India in a rural poor population with very low health literacy up to a fifth grade education. So that's a very different population than the population of women in whom the symptothermal method was studied, which was a, woman, a population of women in Germany who were well-educated, who were married. So very different patient populations. The other thing to note is with the billing study, once a woman or a couple was enrolled in the study, she was in the study for a year. So if she said at the beginning of the year, their intention was to avoid pregnancy, they were kept in the study. Now, I don't know about you, but I change my mind more than once a year, especially when it comes you know, to, to, to various matters. And so women in the billing study may have changed their mind, couples may have changed their mind and their intention and used the method to achieve pregnancy, but that, was, that would be considered a failure of the method. With the symptothermal study, again, women were enrolled at the beginning if they were choosing to avoid pregnancy. But at the beginning of each cycle, they then had their intentions reassessed. And if they said, no, now we want to use it to achieve pregnancy, they were withdrawn from the study. So the symptothermal method has the highest effectiveness rates for typical use at 98% versus the Billings method, which is about 90%. Um, but again, you're looking at two different populations and the way the studies were done differently. Ultimately, what matters to a woman or a couple is not how effective a method is in a given population. It's how effective is it for me, for my husband and I. How can we learn to use these methods effectively? We talked about how education and learning these methods from a trained instructor matters, but the other thing that really matters is motivation. What is your reason for avoiding pregnancy? For some couples, you know, they may have two or three children and maybe like, yeah, we'd be open to another. We're not actively trying, but it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world if you got pregnant again these people might be willing to take more risks, right? They may have sex on a day where the woman just felt a sensation of wetness or moisture, which according to the Billings method would be considered a fertile day, but they might be like, well, it's probably okay because that level of motivation may not be as high. Whereas if a woman has a serious health condition, you know, or a strong reason for preventing pregnancy, you know, maybe they're going through a major life transition, a move, a financial strain, they may be more motivated, in which case they may choose to only engage in sexual relations after ovulation has occurred and they can confirm that they are no longer able to get pregnant that cycle. So learning from a trained instructor, motivation are two factors that are critically important for women to use a method effectively. But the third factor, and this can't be underestimated, and this is how fertility awareness-based methods differ from other conventional methods of family planning, is partner support, right? So with natural methods, you're not using anything to interfere with the woman's reproductive cycle or her fertility cycle. You're not doing anything to shut it down, right? You can switch from using it to avoid pregnancy one month to using it to achieve pregnancy the next month. And so it's important that a woman has a, a partner or spouse that is supportive of their choice to prevent pregnancy. She has a lot of pressure and they engage in sexual relations because there's a, an imbalance in that dynamic, then it's not going to be as effective. And so it's really important. The other reason why it's really important to have a partner's support is that when women are fertile, when their estradiol is rising, when they're most likely to conceive is when a woman's libido is the highest and when she is the most physically and sexually attractive to her partner. So it makes it all the more challenging to use these methods effectively. And that's why being on the same page with your partner is really, really important. And the reality is, is no two people think alike. So one month, the woman might be like more inclined to want to avoid and the next month, the man might be more inclined. But if you're not on the same page, that can affect effectiveness. So 
It is important to look at typical and correct use to know what the maximum likelihood of, of preventing pregnancy. And with correct use, most, most of these methods are more than 99% effective. So if you are using it correct, correctly, there's a high probability that you could successfully avoid pregnancy. But if your motivation is decreased, if you haven't really learned it correctly, if your partner is on board, effectiveness rates are going to go down. And it's important to remember that fertility awareness-based methods or natural methods are the only true forms of family planning because you can use them to avoid, or again, you change your mind and you choose to engage in any kind of sexual relations during that potential fertile window, there is a potential for pregnancy to occur. Great. So we've talked about how motivation is really important for how effective a method is going to be for you, learning from a trained instructor, using the method that's right for you during your specific period of fertility, whether you're trying to conceive and you're fertile or you're postpartum and temporarily infertile because you're breastfeeding exclusively. So let's get into now a, a little bit more deeper into those different things I just, just discussed. So uh, finding a teacher, for example, how does a woman go about finding a teacher? And then two, if she's using a particular method and it's not working for her current season of fertility, um, how does she decide to look for another method? What are the kind of the different uh, things, different elements of different methods that help a woman decide that that will fit her season of fertility better than maybe the method that she's currently using? Right. Great, great questions. Yeah. Finding a teacher is really important. One of the challenges up until very recently is each method had teachers have teachers listed on their website, but that would require a woman going to multiple different websites to find a teacher in a specific method. At Facts, at Natural Womanhood, you know, we promote all of the evidence-based methods. And so there is information on both of our websites, right? Like I know Natural Womanhood has that quiz, which method is right for us. At Facts, yeah. we've developed a shared decision-making tool for clinicians, doctors, and practitioners to use with patients to help them choose which method is best for them. And again, we've got our facts about fertility webinar that women and couples can observe to help them determine. Um, I believe Natural Womanhood, Couple to Couple League, Facts, all have physician, clinician, and educator directories that include teachers in the various methods. So you can go to the factsaboutfertility.org website, click on the link there. I'm sure um, it's relatively easily available at the Natural Womanhood website as well. You know, there's overlap certainly, but some may, teachers may be listed on different websites. Um, another way to find teachers is talk to your friends that use, you know, various teachers. Who's working well for them? Um, that's always a good option. In terms of what method to use for what phase of life, some methods have more research um, at various phases of life. For example, the Marquette method has done the most research in the postpartum period, and a lot of women find that method to be really easy during, during that window. Um, some women that are just starting and might feel a little bit less confident with the method might like to use a double check method like the symptom thermal method. When I'm working with my adolescent population as a family physician, I care for patients from womb to tomb. Um, with my adolescent girls, I often will use a cervical mucus only method like the Billings method because it's very simple, very straightforward. They're not using it to avoid pregnancy, but really just to monitor their cycle. And that can work really, really well. If a woman is using a method because she's having health-related issues, maybe she's having really irregular cycles or painful periods, and she wants to get at the root cause, some methods like Creighton and FEM and Neofertility have physicians or other clinicians that are trained in using medical protocols to address these um, underlying issues. So they may want to choose to use one of those methods. Again, it really depends on the reason. The one thing I will caution your listeners is that sadly, unfortunately, most physicians are still not familiar with modern fertility awareness-based methods. Um, about a decade ago, a study in Canada showed that only three to 6% of OBGYNs and family doctors were familiar with billings and syndal thermal and lactational amenorrhea method. I'd like to think a decade later with all the work that FAX is doing that that percentage is increasing but if you're having difficulty finding a doctor that's knowledgeable, again, I would refer you to the factsaboutfertility.org website or even emailing us at info at factsaboutfertility.org so we can try and help you connect with a clinician in your area. Again, since the pandemic, that more and more of these physicians are doing telemedicine, 
So it is easier. Um, even if you don't have somebody in your local community, you may be able to find a position that you can work with to address your underlying um, health related issues. So the good news is, is there are lots of options. It can be challenging sometimes to sort through them. Um, many teachers, if you're working with one and you find like, gosh, Creighton just isn't working for me now. I feel like I need something with a double check. You know, your Creighton teacher might know another teacher that they can refer you to. Some women are trained to teach multiple methods. And so you may not even need to train teachers, but have an honest conversation with your teacher and say, this is what's working. This is what's not. Is there another option for me that might fit better for me during this time in my life? So hope that's helpful there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And so what are some of the like red flags for a woman or a couple that a method isn't working for them? Um, that's a great question. I mean, one of the signs I tell people, are you able to make those observations, right? I mean, <clears throat> again, a lot of people tout the symptom thermal method is a great method because it's very effective and you've got that cross check. For me personally, I was terrible at taking my temperature every morning. I'm not a morning person. You have to take your temperature at the same time every day, first thing before you roll out of bed. I'd be in the shower and be like, oh, I totally forgot to take my temperature. So if you're having trouble actually making those observations, then maybe that method is not right for you. You know, for some women, um, if they're having challenges with the cervical mucus observations, it doesn't necessarily mean you, mean you need to abandon the method. It may need, mean you need a little bit more work with your instructor. Some women will have what we call like a basic and fertile pattern where they have a daily discharge and they need to be able to learn to determine what is my basic, you know, daily infertile pattern versus what are the changes in my cervical mucus that reflect the hormonal changes indicating that I'm entering into my fertile window. For some women, the challenge may just come from price, right? I mean, the Marquette method is a great method. People love it during the postpartum period but it requires the use of the clear blue fertility monitor and test strips. So, you know, in Maryland where I practice, we were able to get legislation passed that that would be covered. But if somebody moves from Maryland to New York and now they can't get that covered, then they may need to switch because the test strips are not affordable. You know, we're working very hard to make sure fertility awareness based method education and supplies are being covered, but that's, as you know, is a constant ongoing battle. And we encourage women to speak yes. up and to advocate for, for equal coverage for this very important health service. So if you're finding it challenging to make the specific observations, if you're not just if you're not gelling, you know, with your teacher, I mean, like I'm not the best doctor for every patient, like different people are gonna work better with different instructors. And so find someone that really hears your concerns and can help address those and answer your questions. Um, and don't be afraid, you know, as a physician. If somebody's like, this isn't working for me, then I want to get them connected to somebody that's going to help them meet their healthcare goals. Yeah. And I think the same is true with fertility awareness-based method educators. They want women to find the method that's right for them. And if that means working with a different instructor, they can potentially help connect you with somebody that would be a better fit. Yeah, I think the best instructors are the ones who can say, you know what, my method's not working for you. The one I teach isn't working for you, but here's a method that might, and let me help you find an instructor in that method. And more and more, I think you're seeing instructors embrace that openness to the other methods. So mm -hmm. definitely reach out with questions if you have them to your instructor. Um, mm -hmm. And so let's move into femtech, right? That's <laughs> like a billion dollar industry now, probably. Um, yes, and we're talking dollars. about the clear blue fertility yeah, and we're talking about the Clearboot Fertility Monitor, which is kind of the OG, right, Femtech uh, monitor. Um, but now, you know, you mentioned not remembering to take your temperature in the morning with Symptothermal. Now you don't actually have to remember if you've got, you know, one of the bracelets or the rings or whatever, all the different wearables now that will take mm -hmm. your basal body temperature for you. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the technology that's on the market now that pairs with fertility awareness methods. What are your thoughts on those, um, you know, and, and, and apps, right? Everybody wants to know, can I trust an app to help me yes. monitor and, and make decisions about my fertility? Yeah. All great questions. So yeah, the clear blue fertility monitor is used in the Marquette method and has been well evaluated and studied. Um, there are newer devices like the Mira monitor and the Anito monitor. Um, some of the researchers that have done the research on the Marquette method are currently 
doing research on these monitors as well. Um, and so FACTS tries to keep up to date on the latest research and we publish blog posts about these. And at our conference series this year, we featured a number of presentations on these. So these are currently being evaluated um, and studied. To my knowledge, none of them have been studied from a pregnancy prevention standpoint, but there is emerging research showing promise with these monitors. In terms of temperature taking devices, it always used to be you needed to use a basal body thermometer. But to your point, there are now wearable devices. There's the AVA bracelet and the keg device. Many of these wearables actually record an average daily temperature as opposed to the basal body temperature. And um, the basal body temperature is typically the lowest temperature because it is taken first thing in the morning. Your average temperature may not be that low temperature, but it may actually be slightly higher. What I encourage, because there have not yet been studies on the effectiveness of using wearable devices for the symptom thermal method for preventing pregnancy. So I encourage women, if you want to use a wearable device, do a trial like for a month where you're also checking your basal body temperature just to see how your basal body temperature correlates with that wearable device. And again, it may be that with the basal body thermometer, your temperature is maybe a quarter of a degree lower. Um, but you still see that same changing pattern. And that's really the key is, are you getting that change in pattern? So, um, but again, there's so much need for more research in this area. You know, it's great that there's so much money being invested in the technology, but we need more money being in invested in the research of yeah. these wearable devices. Um, and that transitions beautifully to the next topic, like apps. Facts actually did a review of fertility awareness apps that were on the market back in 2015. So, Seven years ago, there's so many more now. Um, but at the time we had no funding for the research, but we did it anyway because we believed it was important. And we were specifically looking at apps that were marketed to couples to use to avoid pregnancy. And at the time there were nearly a hundred apps on the market that were marketed to avoid pregnancy. We ended up having to exclude over half of the apps because they were actually not based on a modern evidence-based fertility awareness method. Many of them simply used an, a calendar calculation. Even though women could put in their cervical mucus or temperature, it ignored those observations and just calculated the woman's fertility window based on her cycle days, which is not necessarily the most accurate if it's not based on an evidence-based method. So we excluded over half. Um, in the end of the 40 or 50 apps that we did rate, there were about 10 that we could recommend based on their accuracy of the method and based on the fact that there were they were built on a modern evidence-based method. And that, um, that study and that synopsis is available on the FACTS website, factsaboutfertility.org, if you simply search the term apps. Uh, and again, that was published back in 2016. Again, more and more apps are being developed, but at this point, there are still no, there's still no unifying organization that's vetting those apps. FACTS would love to do that if we had the funding available. Um, there are two apps that have been FDA cleared for use for preventing pregnancy, the Natural Cycles app and the DOT app or the DOT algorithm, which has now been incorporated into the Clue app. A couple of things to note, um, FACTS actually did do a research study that was just published this past month in the Contraception Journal that compared the Natural Cycles uh, app and their identification of the fertile window with the um, Cycle Pro Go app, which is based on, used by the Cycle Couple to Couple League and based on the Frank Herman research that shows the highest effectiveness for the symptom thermal method. And there, unfortunately, were a lot of days that the Natural Cycles app identified as not being fertile, that the Cycle Pro Go app identified as being fertile. So it's really important to just be aware of that, that, you know, an app in and of itself does not guarantee effectiveness. I always tell women, you are smart. You are smarter than your smartphone or any app or device that you can use. It's always best to learn these methods effectively. Uh, learn how to use these methods effectively by working with a trained instructor. I think apps can be fantastic tools to facilitate tracking or sharing that information with your teacher or with your clinician. But when it comes to you know, learning to use the method, especially for pregnancy prevention, I always encourage women 
to use to learn from a trained instructor and use the, the app as a tool to facilitate tracking. Now, there are other apps on the market like the FEM app. Um, FEM itself as a method, the Fertility Education and Medical Management, has never done a study of their method for pregnancy prevention because their focus is really on women's health monitoring and management. And I think the FEM app is a great app because it provides a lot of feedback to women um, and can be very, edu very educational. But again, if you're using it from a family planning perspective, it may not be best to use alone without additional instruction. So final note about apps, um, and this was one thing that we discovered you know, somewhat to, to our dismay in our app study, is that you really need to read the fine print in terms of what they are doing with your data. You're entering in very personal, very sensitive information that reflects enormous amount of information about you and your health. Um, and many of these apps did not have any privacy protection clauses in place. So I encourage you, when, you know, buyer beware when it comes to choosing an app. Um, just because it's the highest rated in the Google store or the app store doesn't necessarily mean it is the safest or the most effective um, or the highest rated. Again, I would at least refer to the facts about fertility.org website for our app study. And we do frequently publish updates on apps as the research becomes available. So certainly encourage you to review that information there. Yeah, and I, I wanna just kind of, and when we're getting to, into closing now, um, get back to what you said about women being smart, right? Women can learn to read the signs of their bodies. Um, and while mm -hmm. the new technology is great, um, it's, it's encouraging, um, it can be very helpful. We don't want to be using it as a crutch, right? In place of right. actually learning to read the signs of our body. So even the new monitors that you mentioned, the Myra and, and uh, kind of the newer ones that have been coming out that may or may not end up replacing clear blue someday, um, that test hormone levels, right? That seems so, super subjective and, and how could they be wrong? How could you get pregnant using, you know, a monitor that gives you an objective, sorry, not subjective, but objective hormone yes. reading. Um, we, we don't want to run into where women are, are just using these methods and, and doing what they tell them to do rather than right. reading the signs of their bodies and making the decision themselves right. about what they're going to do. Um, right. Right. A absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, women are smart. And I think one of the things that has been frustrating to me over the years, as I've been in this space and working with my medical colleagues, um, there's this presumption that women can use these methods if they're well-educated and if they're white and if they're married and they're a super supportive relationship. But these methods are not appropriate for you know, women with low health literacy, women that come from lower socioeconomic classes, minority women. And I think that is patently false. And I think it does a huge disservice um, to women by saying that you're not smart enough to learn to observe your signs. As I noted, the one uh, highly effective billing study was done in a population of women, um, almost 90% had less than a fifth grade education. So they have shown that women from all walks of life, from all educational levels, from all socioeconomic statuses can learn to use these methods effectively. It may take some more time, depending on you know her observations, depending on her skill set. But women are smart, and I think for decades we have been told that the only way we can manage our fertility is to shut it down, right? To take a pill to turn off our reproductive hormones, um, to use a device to create physical barriers, which is simply not true. And now women are being told, well, you need technology to tell you when you're fertile and when you're not. Again, technology can assist by providing you the information, but women, when they learn to observe their signs, they can identify when they are fertile and when they are not, and if they can see when they most likely can see, and if there are issues, what those issues may be. You know, FACTS recently published a, um, a comprehensive overview of fertility awareness-based methods for women's health and family planning that talks not only about the effectiveness of these methods for preventing pregnancy and achieving pregnancy, but also for monitoring women's health. And I think as a society, women would be well served if we took the time to educate them when they're young, as adolescents. And you know, full disclosure, I'm trained as a teen star educator. Facts now has a webinar presentation called Know Your Body, specifically for teenagers. And teenagers can learn to chart their cycles. And it's really important. 
The American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and the American Academy of Pediatrics both recognize the female cycle as the fifth vital sign of health that women should learn to monitor beginning in adolescence. And so our society would do well to recognize all women are smart and capable of learning to observe the signs of their cycle and using that information to interpret whether or not they may be fertile or may not be. Um, and if they need support, encourage them, help them engage with a trained instructor that can help them as they're learning this process. In the beginning, it might be really challenging. Like I used the analogy earlier, riding a bike, you're like, how am I gonna balance and go forward and not fall off? But once you get into that rhythm of like making those daily observations and learning what's normal for you and what you know is an indicator of your fertile window, you can become very, very adept at this. And so I think I encourage my medical professional colleagues to move away from this patriarchal approach that women can't possibly manage their fertility and rather, you know, do what we do. We educate um, and empower women and engage men in the care of fertility and in the family planning conversation. And that's, that's the way it should be because frankly, women are smart. They're smarter than their smartphones. They're smarter than the technology. Um, and together with their teachers, they can learn to accurately track their cycle and with their partner effectively plan for their families. Well, that is the perfect spot to end, Dr. Duane. Thank you so much for anybody listening. Thank you for tuning in. Um, look for more resources, certainly at factsaboutfertility.org and at naturalwomanhood.org. Uh, um, and you know, if you wanna find, find an instructor, find a doctor, find out more about the various methods. You can do all of those things at, at our organization's websites at Natural Womanhood and at FACTS. Um, and we encourage you to seek out more information, to reach out to folks at our organizations. We're always happy to answer questions where we can. Um, at the end of the day, we both are just very passionate about getting this information into women's hands um, to really change, you know, not only women's health, but the culture with the empowering message of women's fertility being good um, and being a fifth vital sign. Normal and healthy. Health. Yep, absolutely. Now, thank you, Dr. Duane, very much. Thank you so much, Grace. It was such a pleasure to be with you again. You too. Thanks. <laughs>